Welcome to another exciting segment of the Sure Word of Prophecy. We have entitled this week, Foundation Stones. We are looking at the principles that God has given us for living in these last days. These principles for living transcend time and in fact, culture and race and gender as well as age. It's for all of us who call ourselves Christians, biblical Christians. Our objective in this series has been to show you how the word of God told us that we would live in these times, that we would come face to face with a lawless society, where people would cast aside the word of God, where the truth of his word would no longer be lifted up, and that we would see time and again at every level of life, abuse, as well as neglect, as well as hardship, poverty, war, bloodshed, indifference, callousness, racism. All of these things are covered in the prophetic word of God. And when they're not mentioned specifically, they're mentioned in generalities. Because the Bible tells us we are living in times where men will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. We're gonna challenge you today with the objective of looking at life differently and understanding how the Lord has called this church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, into existence. Let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us the privilege of coming together and studying your word. Bless us now as we open your word and as we begin to study your word, may it indeed become a matter of principle for us that we will live in accordance thereby. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. There are two references I want to ask you to consider with me. And in fact, I ask you to turn in your Bibles and if you're using an electronic device, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 4. Pardon me, chapter 4, beginning with verse 3. Listen to what the word of God has to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, means it's hidden to us. We don't understand it. We can't comprehend it. It is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, that would be Satan, hath blinded the my, minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Verse 5, Paul testifies, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ, Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. And listen to how Paul so very pointedly calls us out of darkness, but he begins with speaking about light. For God who hath commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So as Christians, we live differently. And yesterday in our presentation, we actually spent time talking about how it's imperative that we are different from the world. And we gave you that in the context of the spiritual battle that exists between those who are the followers of God and those who are the followers of Satan. Now, that's a harsh term for some, and you're hearing that through the filters of the fact that you may have relatives and friends who are still in other churches and other Christian fellowships, and you're worried about them, and you don't want to think of them as following Satan, but the line is very clear in Scripture. The line of demarcation, of separation, is profoundly clear. Because when we look at the word of God, God is, is saying to us, he's sharing with us in his word that there are certain things that are non-negotiables. These non-negotiables to begin with is the seven day Sabbath observance. And we spent time taking you through how even in uh, the context of papal disclosures, they are very clear that there are only two churches as far as they are concerned in the world. That's Roman Catholicism and of course, Seventh-day Adventism. They actually say it in various publications and also in their news uh, 
journals and even in their websites. So why do we make this distinction? Well, we really don't. The Bible does. And the Bible gives it to us in clarity when it says that here are they that keep the commandments of God. And so Jesus is clear. Either we are with him or we are not. So our tendency in the church today to try to commingle the things of the world, to try to facilitate this uh, infusion of culture and race and class, as well as personal preferences, even our personal opinions, has to do with the fact that we are obsessed with being what we want the church to be. In other words, we're asking the church to take on our fallen personalities. Paul says it this way, the Apostle Paul says it this way, our carnal nature. So instead of dying to self and saying that we will follow the Lord, we bring the world into the church. And we bring the world in various forms, and we do it because we don't want to be separate from the world. We want to be like the world. We want to see ourselves being as close to the world, but yet at the same time being saved. I want to bring it to clarity today. It will not happen. God will not tolerate this syncretistic or syncretism that we have infused into the church today. So the Lord is actually calling us to let go of the things of Babylon, which is why the appeal is found in Revelation chapter four, uh, 14, 6 through 12, and also Revelation 18, to come out of Babylon. And to come out of Babylon is not just a physical relocation, it is a mental relocation. It is a, trans, it's a transference or a, a movement from a mindset that suggests that we can give God whatever we want, which is the mind of Cain. So in the church, we have people who have the mind of Cain. We want to give God what we want. But today we're going to share with you that God did not call this church into existence to be like any other church. He called it into existence to be different. But before we actually consider those things, we need to actually bring into focus how the distinction between a Christian, a biblical Christian, and the world are at odds. If you will, join me in turning to 1 John chapter 2 and verses 15 through 17. You're familiar with these verses, and these verses help to give us a context of why it's important to understand that this church has a specific and unique responsibility. Because in the general context of how we are to function as God's people, he gives us a clarity on not being like anything that is in the world. Listen to what the Apostle John says. Love not the world. That's a directive. That's a command. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So notice how this works. If we love the world, then the love of the Father, which is what Jesus focused our attention on, to do his will, our Heavenly Father's will, then the love of the Father is not in us. And that not only translates to us individually, it translates to our families, it translates to the churches. And how does that translate? Because the individual, in, the individual members make up the church. Now, the church is built upon Christ himself, but ultimately the community of believers facilitates the visible body of Christ in the world. And if the visible body of Christ in the world is conveying a worldliness, a secular mindedness, a humanistic perspective or philosophy, then we are manifesting a false Christ. We are representing a Christ that he is not. But the Bible goes further. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So the will of God abides forever because the will of God is eternal. And so we can sidestep it, we can avoid it, we can try to dismiss it, 
We can try to contextualize it. We can attempt to uh, even infuse into the word of God what we want. But brothers and sisters, he will not change. That's why the Bible tells us so clearly, I am the Lord, I change not. So he says that to us so that we will understand that he is very specific in what he is expecting his children to be. So grace is given to us not simply for the forgiveness of our sins, but also to bring our lives in harmony with the will of God. And God called this church into existence for the express purpose of understanding or correction for helping the world to understand that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I want to take you on a little journey in history, and I want us to take a look at the fact that when the Seventh-day Adventist Church was brought into existence right around 1844, and of course, remember, that period that we call the Great Disappointment was actually a great realignment because people had to go back to the Word of God. They had to come to terms with the fact that they had infused into the Word of God their perspective, and that was they thought that the earth was the sanctuary or the earth was the temple. And so when the, they saw the cleansing of the sanctuary as being the earth, they thought that to be a connection to the second coming of Jesus. They had the right understanding of a cleansing, but they had the wrong location and the wrong transaction. So once they came to clarity on that, then after a period of time, there was a coalescing of these, these individuals who believed the same thing, and they were initially identified as Advent believers, meaning that they believed in the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that's important for us to note because when they started uh, promoting, preaching, teaching Advent, the Advent hope, the second coming of Jesus Christ, they were actually teaching a doctrine that the church as a whole, Protestantism, was not preaching or teaching. In fact, in some fellowships, if you want to call it that, they didn't even believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ, not as it is held by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In time, they became acquainted with the necessity of observing the Seventh-day Sabbath, that the Seventh-day Sabbath is still binding upon all humanity. But at the same time that the Lord was raising this continuation of the Reformation to the, or bringing it to the forefront, there were, other, there were other counterfeit systems that Satan was raising as well. You may not be aware of it, but right around the same time you have the introduction of Freemasonry in the United States. Freemason, Freemasonry was already in Europe, but it was introduced in a significant way in the United States. Now, that's important for us to note because actually Benjamin Franklin was a Freemason, and uh, he became a Freemason, of course, probably, I believe, if I remember correctly, during his time when he was in France as an ambassador from the United States to France. And so he joins this he joins this organization, of course, and because Benjamin Franklin was a significant player in the, the Re American Revolutionary War and so on and so forth, then he becomes an influencer and other individuals of significance in America begin to gravitate to it as well as the fact that George Washington, uh, the first president of the United States, was a Freemason and so on and so forth. Well, Freemasonry really began to take off in the middle of the 19th century or the 1800s. You also have a rise of spiritualism and theosophy. And I never will forget when I was visiting uh, Independence Hall there in Philadelphia, and I noticed a small building to the, uh, I think it was to the south of Independence Hall, there was this, this placard acknowledging that this particular building was a center for theosophy. And I wasn't quite sure what that was. It was my first encounter with that. So I went back and began to do some research. And really, theosophy is another form of spiritualism. But we're not going to go down that road. It's just to acquaint you with what that means. And then there was a rise of false prophets. And the false prophets began to rise around the United States specifically. And then, of course, the Mormon movement uh, and this is the precursor to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they had a prophet, and that prophet 
uh, actually was one that was acknowledged in their circles or in their uh, particular uh, denomination to have received a visit from a particular angel from heaven. And that is unique in and of itself. But the one thing that we can understand of just one uh, attribute or characteristic of a true prophet is that they will live in harmony with the word of God. And so when you see the polygamy uh, and all that transpired with the foundation of this faith, and that's not supported in the word of God, then you understand that this is outside of God's calling and hence not Christian. And then you have the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Jehovah's Witnesses continue to set dates and times for the second advent until they actually resigned to the idea that Jesus had come and he literally is living among us, but he hasn't manifested himself yet. That's a little different. Then you have the Christian science movement and you have their prophet, Mary Baker Eddy, and uh, you have all these different movements and emphasis that come around the same time as the origin or the beginnings of the Seventh-day Adventist church. During the same time period that the remnant preaches the message of separation, Satan set in motion a counterfeit unity, which was to center on, on humanism. And basically, man was elevated to a place of deification. Uh, and man believed that he had the solution to all problems. And that's, that's where we have the humanistic thought that says that man is actually progressing and becoming better and better. And of course, that overlaps with evolution in the idea of the survival of the fittest and also the, the notion that ultimately uh, man can improve his circumstances here on this earth. And they even adopted something that looked very similar to the Ten Commandments in what was called the Human Rights Declaration of the French Revolution in 1798. Then you have the uh, continued uh, deception that comes as a result of Karl Marx and he joined the League of the Just in 1844, 1842, pardon me, later the League of Communists, and he started writing the Communist Manifesto in 1844. That's an interesting correlation or overlap, if you will, that in 1844, he introduces communism, and in 1844, we know that the investigative judgment begins. So humanity at that time was speaking more and more about unity, coming together, and their coming together was in many, in many ways and very frequently orbiting around very satanic influences, spiritualism and very unbiblical principles, all right? Then we also have uh, the Baha'i faith. It came along in 1844. And then we have Darwin, whose first edition comes along at the same time. And so all of this was connecting and ultimately gives birth to the concept of the United Nations. Now, the United Nations comes around, of course, after the League of Nations was formed, which was right around or before the, uh, the World War II event. And then after World War II, you have the United Nations or the nations of the earth coming together in the context of seeking to be united and hence the United Nations. Uh, but this is a quote that's worth noting. It says, my great personal dream is to get a tremendous alliance between all the major religions and the United Nations or the UN. Now, here is where it begins to take a turn. So although there is a period of time between the origin of these particular faiths that are not biblical, that are not scriptural, that are not uh, supportive of what the Lord gives us, what Christ gives us in Revelation 12, 17, as keeping the commandments of God, we begin to really see that what's motivating this Satan behind the scenes is seeking to draw all the world together, to create a commonality, to create a, a common commitment between nations. But we also have the introduction of thought now of creating a commonality of religions. Well, now that becomes challenging when you think of the Baha'i faith and you think of Hinduism and you think of Islam, and you think of Catholicism, you think of Protestantism, and all of the other religions that are probably lesser known to you and I, but at the same time, they are religious groups around the world, Buddhism and so on and so forth. Well, the question then becomes, how do you bring all of these nations together? 
And this is why we're focusing on the agenda. This is the first of two parts on the agenda. How do they pull all of the nations and religions together? Now, in the previous uh, message, we talked about the fallacy of all of the churches coming together, at least in the context of our being able to join with those churches. Uh, and that's because they don't support keeping of the commandments of God. And once you have that as your delineating identification or your, your clear, you have a clear understanding of why God is actually calling us to, to serve and witness for him and to represent to the world what it means to be uh, a part of the, those who are strictly following Jesus Christ, then you realize you have a problem because as we have already mentioned in the previous message, that you have the problem of Sabbath versus Sunday observance. You have the problem of the distinction between the, uh, the soul sleep that we teach, that the dead are really dead and they know nothing, and the idea of the immortality of the soul, which is really a pagan philosophy. And we could go on and on. I mean, the whole concept of the investigative judgment and the sanctuary model in the plan of salvation is not understood by other denominations. Why did the Lord entrust that? Well, you have to ask yourself, why did the, the Lord entrust with Martin Luther to bring to the forefront the just shall live by faith? Why did the Lord bring to uh, Tyndall's understanding and capacity the ability to translate the word of God into the English language? And let me just share this with you. I happen to read from the King James Version, but if you read out of the King James Version, much of the phraseology and the literary structure was actually crafted not by those who, uh, who structured and who, I don't want to use the word authored, but who really pulled together in the English translation, the King James Version. They extracted from Tyndall such words like atonement. Atonement was not a word that was in the original language that was clearly identified. In fact, when you go back to he the Hebrew, we sometimes don't have adequate words to express what is conveyed by the original language. So he actually created a word by bringing three words together at one meant togetherness uh, to talk about the atonement, to describe, to define the atonement, the day of at one meant, the day of atonement, at one with the Lord. So we are actually living in the antitypical day of atonement since 1844, meaning that we are living at the same time that when the children of Israel were to bring themselves before the Lord, there was a preparatory process that they would go into, and we need to study that. And while that is not a part of the study today, let me just give you this in a in encapsulated form, in a, in a summarized form. Let me just say this, that there were two things that they were supposed to do in preparation for the Day of Atonement. First of all, they were to afflict themselves, which meant that they were to bring themselves un under submission. They were to place themselves at the feet of the Lord, and, and symbolically, and they were to actually spend time looking at their characters, asking the Lord whether or not they were in line with him. And the second thing was they were to fast and abstain from any unnecessary work. Now, of course, there were basic chores or things that they had to do, but a necessary work meant that they would not focus on enrichment or building wealth. That's unnecessary work. So in the antitypical Day of Atonement, Satan has found a way to get God's people to be busy about becoming wealthy, about building and about expanding and about uh, growing their, their portfolio, which takes our minds away from having a heavenly mindset. Now, there are those, as the Bible says, it is the power of God in us to get wealth. It's God, really, that gives us the power to get wealth. Well, there are some that the Lord blesses with that ability that they're just able to grow wealth or to grow their money to wealth. But the Lord is calling us not to be focused on the things of this world, as we have read, but to be focused on heavenly things because what's happening is the Lord is seeking to form his church, to craft his church, to call his church out of the world more distinctly, more profoundly, more uniquely, 
while Satan, on the other hand, is calling his people into the world to unity, to commonality, to a bond of commitment and, and, and interrelation that will keep them bound together through the very close of probation. All of this is important for us because this means that we don't live today as if we don't have a purpose or a focus and a commitment. So let's talk about what the Catholics perceive and how they factor in all of this, all right? The final object of ecumenism, that's the coming together that we were talking about, as Catholics conceive it, is unity in faith, worship, and acknowledgement of supreme spiritual authority of the Bishop of Rome. Now, I want you to focus on that for just a moment. So if you understand the game plan of ecumenism that Satan is seeking to uh, and pursuing, seeking to achieve by bringing all the religions together, by bringing even the nations together, if they know this particular group, the, the papacy, if they know that their objective is for the acknowledgement of supreme spiritual authority of the Bishop of Rome, then I have a question. How can we think that we can ever have anything in common with or a mindset of ecumenism with those churches that are headed in that direction. In fact, most of them are already within the grasp of Rome, and we're gonna prove that to you as we go through the message today and the message tomorrow. When we consider this photograph again, I'm bringing it back to you again, because they took the photo, and for me, it was just the greatest opportunity for me to, to extract it and say, okay, capture it, and let's use it so that you can get an idea of what it means to have ecumenism. Now, you see the different faiths there, their garb or their dress is different based upon their various belief systems, but here is the one thing to take note, that out of all of the different religions or denominations that are represented there, they're standing in what church? A Roman Catholic church. So ultimately, they even in the photograph deal with their, by their, their presence and by their being in the Catholic Church are basically saying under one leadership. It's not spoken, it's understood. One of the things we have to understand that is also driving the agenda of what we see today is a papal encyclical that was presented by Pope Francis in 2015. It, uh, I'm sharing with you the cover to that, it's the encyclical letter, Laudato Si, of the Holy Father Francis on care for our common home. Now, one of the things that you really have to watch when you read any of the documents that, comes, that come out of the Vatican is that they're wordsmiths, and they have a way of saying a lot, and they also can make very pointed statements, but unless you are really looking for those statements and understand what they're saying, you can sometimes miss it, the importance of what they're saying. So let me share it with you this way. Laudato Si have, have, is a document that has a lot of things in it, but there are some very critical things that come out of Laudato Si that you wanna know about, because believe it or not, they're being implemented. Now you may say, really? Yes. And they don't need our permission to implement it. They're doing it because they have a goal. So let's go back to this quotation that we had, and that is, the final object of ecumenism, and as Catholics conceive it, is unity in faith, worship, and the acknowledgement of supreme spiritual authority of the Bishop of Rome. If you want to know why the music emphasis of the churches is so pervasive, and I'm speaking of not just the black church and the white church, or not just Adventist churches, I'm talking about all churches, is because in Vatican II, a decision was made that the way to get all of the churches to come together is de-emphasize, de-emphasize the word of God so we don't hear strong preaching from our pulpits and de-emphasize the word of God and emphasize music. Well, music brings people together. Music is a unifier, especially when it is popular music. So you take popular music, which is already uh, designed by Satan to draw the world to him, and then you add so-called 
Christian words throughout, and then you have this crossover, and then that crossover appeal connects with people out in the world and also in the church. But then that becomes a problem because the Bible says love not the world. So if you create a worship format which de-emphasizes scripture. So again, the Bible is not what's important. Worship is in the context of music. So if you notice what has happened in our churches today, we have 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes of music. And then you get this repetition, 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 and the repetition is a hypnotic element which creates this, this seductive draw into a non-thinking congregation. In other words, what you end up with is people who are in church, but like a concert, they don't even know why they're there. They're going for the fix. And you don't think about it, you just do it. You kind of go with it. And people need the music. They need, the, they need the, all, that, all of the uh, embellishment that comes with the music. So you have to have lots of instruments. And, they get, and if you notice in churches where music is the emphasis, they keep adding more and more instruments. Well, rightly played and rightly presented, it can create a beautiful context. But notice that the emphasis that has been stated in this quotation is an outgrowth of what really was finalized and implemented in Vatican II. That to bring all of religions together, ecumenism, as Catholics conceive it, is unity in faith. Well, I can't have unity in faith when they say they have authority to change the word of God, so there's no unity there. And worship, well, I don't believe in the Eucharist, so there's no unity there. And the acknowledgement of supreme spiritual authority of the Bishop of Rome, well, you certainly don't have a connection there. But if the other churches are already circling and they are landing in their pocket, then the question has to be, why are we with those other churches? And why are we taking on their worship style? And why are we actually diminishing the significance of the word of God? And it's because we have bought the hype. It's kind of like you buy the commercial. The commercial is taught, or I should say, the commercial is presented so frequently to us that we embrace the idea that we ought to, we ought to do it. We believe it. Not because it's true, because we don't compare it with the word of God. But what we do is we just accept it because it's what everybody's doing. And then we look at the mega churches and we get all excited about that. And so then we come to this group and we say, man, those guys' churches are flourishing. We want our churches to be like them. Oh, really? So you really want to be like the people who are moving toward Rome. Is that what you really want? Well, the question is, is all of this a part of a master plan? And when you add to that, this emphasis of the sensitivity and the concern for environmental issues, Notice our common home. Is there an agenda? Is there something that they're moving toward? Is there an objective that they're headed to? Well, there actually is. So now we have to go to the tough question. So I'm asking the question in this particular message that is the first part of two, the agenda. How do they achieve global religion? How do they get there? Because if you're going to get to a particular destination, you have to have a particular path. So how do you get to global religion, all right? So let's find out. We're gonna to get to global religion. First of all, let's go to the Bible. So I provided the scripture for you because I really want you to see the scripture and I don't want to take any chance that you're not opening your Bible. I want, to, I want you to see the scripture. Listen to what it says. These have one mind, ecumenism, and shall give their power and strength unto the beasts. Now, in the context of Revelation 17, this is not only all religions come together, but all nations come together. Let's see if we find a phrase in our vocabulary that fits that profile. Hmm. All the nations come together. I think we do. New world order. Yep, sounds like the same thing. So when the Bible gave us this, the Bible, the Lord was really saying to us, there's going to come a time before Jesus comes that all of the nations will come together. Was there a time in biblical history when all the nations came together? Quick answer, yes. When was it? It was at the Tower of Babel. 
what was their common, th common uh, thread. It was religion, or the common bonding element was religion. But it was a religion that was directly and distinctly defying God. How do we know that? Because God said, I will, no longer, I will never again destroy the earth by a flood. I do put my bow in the clouds. So the bow was in the clouds, but Nimrod and the boys said, no, we don't believe you. So now you end up with defiance. So they crafted, created under satanic influence, a religious system that defied God. Very similar to Cain and Abel. However, Nimrod took it to a whole nother level. He created a whole worship system. It was the first organized pagan system that we ever had on this planet. Organized pagan system. We touched on some of that in our previous messages, but we specifically want to take your mind in the direction of how this is a counterfeit, this is a counterfeit reunion of the Tower of Babel. So bringing all the nations together is actually taking humanity all the way back to the Tower of Babel, which God literally dispersed the nations, but Satan wants the nations to come back together. Because if he brings the nations back together, he can have control over all the earth. Why does he want control over all the earth? Because there's another agenda that he has, and that is the eradication of God's people. Now this is gonna be a pretty blunt presentation. So I want you to know that this is not a time to break out the popcorn, because this is not gonna be a fun, this is not a movie. This is not gonna be a fun time. This is an opportunity for you to get your head straight and to understand with clarity that this is a serious time and that this is not a time to play. So even though we are all in a state of, uh, I guess you could say, um, I like to use the word confinement. There's some people that don't like that word, but that's what COVID-19 has done. It's put us all in a state of confinement. I wanna ask you a tough question. Here's a question that is a thought question. You don't have to answer. Of course, I won't hear you, but I want you to think about it. I wanna actually prompt you into mentally engaging this process. What do we see not happening as retail stores are being gradually reopened? Do you see a reopening of churches? Nope. Do you notice that you don't have a reopening of churches, although you have a close proximity between hairstylists and patron, between uh, those who shop at the store and the sales clerk? And although you may have a mask, I mean, let's just all be clear, that's a whole lot closer than church. But let me ask you this question. Here's a follow-up question to my previous questions. What happens if churches can't reopen? Here's a tough answer. Churches can go out of business, as it were, because you don't have funding. You don't have any connection to supporting the ministry and to supporting the actual building because we're in a, my church building right now, but at the same time, there are churches that have huge mortgages. Well, if you're not receiving gifts and offerings and tithes from parishioners, who's paying the mortgage? How are they affording the mortgages? So are churches possibly going to go belly up? Very possibly. And let me ask you this, who benefits from this anyway? Because if America, which is predominantly a Protestant nation, finds mega churches and mini churches, meaning M-I-N-I, -I, small churches, closing, who benefits? Well, as a minister, I can tell you this, that most churches are, have, have seen a 20 to 40% decline in their giving. But if you're bringing all the world together, you have to not only construct, you have to deconstruct. Convenient, COVID-19, deconstruction of Protestant churches. Let's go further. And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So there are three classifications of those who stay with the Lord. What are they? Called, chosen, faithful. Drill that in. Called, chosen, faithful. All right. So all of this tripping that we have done within Adventism of we don't want to be exclusive. Well, truthfully, as far as Christ is concerned, they're called, they're chosen and faithful. Not exclusive, but pretty special. 
So does that special make them better? No, because all of sin comes short of the glory of God. So the question is, so what does it make, it make them? It makes them accountable to Christ to bear the message of Christ and to also represent Christ. Listen to this. This is in the context of something we're going to launch into because one of the things that we have to understand for all of this globalization to be effective is a realignment of our thinking. How do we get a realignment of our thinking? Well, there is a strategy. There is, dare I use the word, an agenda. Let's look at this. And this came from the former Secretary General of the United uh, Nations. Listen to what he said. The world will not change and find peace if there is not a new education. One more time, repetition drives the point home. The world will not change and find peace if there is not a new education. So what kind of education is he talking about? What type of education is he referring to? What kind of education is he really pushing that he is not defining in this statement? Now, who thought, I think it was Secretary General, maybe like the latter part of the 20th century, probably way back in the, I think if I remember correctly, somewhere in the 80s, maybe even the 70s. I don't think as late as the 90s. So how long ago were they talking about new education? A long time ago. So let's talk about what it looks like and how it actually integrates or intersects with Laudato Si. Pope Francis invites religious political leaders to sign a global pact for new humanism. Now, notice that he's at the United Nations. He's at the United Nations. He's at the very seat of the place where there is an agenda to bring all the nations together. Well, they're not really together, but he is the moral voice, the moral voice that pulls everybody together. He is the individual leader that actually creates an opportunity for people to say they're united. Or to put it another way, he is a unifying figure for the world. Well, did the Bible say this would occur? The Bible did. The Bible said that all the world will wonder after the beast. That's a mental connection, not a physical movement toward the beast. So this mental connection to the beast has to come as a result of being unified according to what were the three things we saw in that Catholic priest understanding as he articulated the understanding of the Catholic premise of ecumenism, faith, okay, and worship, and regard for the pontiff as a supreme leader. Okay, those are your three working pieces to that. Well, let's talk about what this education looks like. Pope, Fra Pope Francis emphasized in this Catholic news agency that the common good has become global. And I took this particular slide from Amazing Discoveries. And in a previous uh, message, I talked about this ministry and highly recommend that you become acquainted with Amazing Discoveries. Now, Amazing Facts is great for evangelism, and Amazing Discoveries has a different role. Its objective is to really build our faith and help us to understand the deep prophetic uh, developments that are transpiring today. And there's a lot of history that you can obtain from Amazing Discoveries, which is a Seventh-day Adventist ministry as well. But nevertheless, Pope Francis calls on nations to work toward a global common good Thursday, and this is talking about that particular time frame. How recent was this? Well, if you can look at the smaller print, you will see May the 2nd, 2019. This is May 2020. So within a year, within the year, so to speak, we have seen him call for this global re-education. And then he talks about the common good becoming global. So now let's go back to this. So this was a call for a global pact for a, all the religious and political leaders to sign a global pact for new humanism. And the original date for that was May 14, 
2020. Now, COVID-19 pushed it out a little bit further. We'll, we'll deal with that later. Then he also talked about all nations to work towards a global common good, particularly in confronting climate change. Well, remember what Laudato C is about. Laudato C is about calling us to a unity for the care of our common home. What's the use of this word common? It gets flipped around a lot, all right? Human trafficking and nuclear threats. Now the nation state, notice what he says, the nation state is no longer able to procure the common good of its population alone. And then finally, that which is in bold, the common good has become global and nations must associate for their own benefit. So basically he's saying, this is an ultimatum. If you really want to benefit, you have to be a part of this unification and it's for the common good. Well, that's enlightening. So what is the principle of the common good according to the Roman Catholic Church? And these slides, again, I extract or I uh, obtain from amazing discoveries. So notice, if you will, here's the principle of common good in the Catholic Church's social doctrine. Now, let me just slide this little statement in that you have a lot of our ministers who are talking about mm, social justice. Social justice is in, act, is in actuality something also that came out of Vatican II. And it came out of Vatican II as a way of creating ecumenism. So we de-emphasize the word of God so we don't elevate scripture. We don't talk about scripture. We talk about social justice. We talk about social parity. We talk about social equity. We talk about social civil rights. But in, within that civil rights is the elevation of uh, uh, rights for homosexuals and so on and so forth, which is unbiblical. So the more you drill down on this, the more you recognize that you have a parsing and you have a separation between what is social and what's biblical. So what is biblical is where the Lord wants us to be. But the social part is where humanity is in their objective to believe that they can make society what they want it to be and thereby fix society because at the same time, remember the humanistic view is we can improve the world, which comes as a result of evolution because evolution says that there's a survival of the fittest. So in the end, you always end up with somebody winning and somebody losing, but it's all okay because ultimately it's gonna play out that way simply because some people were not meant to be here. Hmm. Everyone also has the right to enjoy the conditions of social life that are brought about by the quest for the common good. Now, I'm going to read several slides for you, so I invite you to follow along. The teaching of Pope Pius, is, uh, Pope Pius XI is still relevant. Quote, the distribution of created goods, which as every discerning person knows, is laboring today under the gravest evils due to the huge disparity between the few exceedingly rich and the unnumbered property less, those without property, what must be effectively called back to and brought into conformity with the norms of common good. That is, what is that called? Social justice. Okay, so when our Ministers get up and they naively use that phrase, social justice, that's their term. Not our term, that's their term. And remember what social justice really means in a working definition as it pertains to their theology. It has nothing to do with getting parity and social equality, civil rights. It has to do with the distribution of created goods being redistributed, which means that there is going to be a deconstruction of the economic systems of the world so that there is a so-called parity of economies. Let that sink in. All right, that's social justice. Listen to this, the task of the political community, the responsibility for attaining the common good besides falling to individual persons belongs also to the state. So now the state is gonna get involved in dictating what is the common good. Well, if the state dictates what the common good is, the state is gonna tell you how to live and what you can have and what you can't have. That's dangerous. For living a truly human life. Now notice that, that paragraph 
or the latter part of the paragraph, the individual person, the family or intermediate groups are not able to achieve their full development by themselves for living a truly human life. So at the, the very last sentence, the goal of life and society is in fact the historically attainable common good. How is that achieved? All right, well, notice that you don't have to take it from that document. You can also go to their periodicals or publications and they will tell you what the common good is. Notice what it says in bold at the bottom of the page. Also necessary is the state which acts a lot like a coach to guarantee coherency, unity, and organization of the civil society. Well, that means that the state is going to be doing more or less controlling. Which one do you see coming? More or less controlling. Okay, so let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. When you have all of this realignment that's occurring as a result of COVID-19, question is, when you hear somebody stand in the pulpit, kind of like this one, and they say, we're going to go back to normal, are they prophetically astute? Or are they possibly saying what they hope because they have no idea what's really going on? You make the decision. All right, let's go to another one. Catholic social thought of and the common good. Now this is actually pretty good because this is where we really, have, we really drill down on who's really behind all of this thought. And so if you notice in the dark banner, it says Jesuit Social Research Institute, Catholic social thought and the common good. I want you to look for that key phrase that all of our younger pastors love to use. It's called social justice. Let's see if they have a part to play in what that really means. All right, the common good applies to each community, human community, but its most complete realization occurs in the political community where the state's role is to defend and promote the common good of civil society, its citizens, and intermediate bodies. All right, next one. Here we go. The common good's conceptual roots are not biblical. They lie in Greek and Roman philosophy. So let's make sure we really understand this. So these preachers that are utilizing the idea of social justice in the pulpit on God's seventh day Sabbath in a holy context, which is the church, it isn't even biblical. Although they're grabbing for scriptures, trying to support their premise, guess what? It's not even biblical, not in that context. Well, let me just give you the one critical text or, or statement by Jesus that really flips everything on its ear, that really challenges us to move out of that concept. And that is, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. So he's not trying to fix society. He's not trying to achieve social parity or any particular type of social equality. Why? Because the social equality really has more to do with the fact that when people are in Christ, like when they're members of this church, they should treat each other with dignity and with mutual respect in Christian love. But don't expect that from people in the world because they don't have Christ living in them. So the whole concept of social justice and, and equality is a misnomer in the context of sin. I mean, how do you get equality in a world of spiritual inequality. I mean, you have wickedness and you have righteousness. You have sin and you have holiness. So tell me this, how in the world do you think we're gonna ever get to people liking people, people loving people in a world of sin? You're living in a world of make-believe if you think that, because on this planet, you can't change people's hearts. No, no. What you can do is you can have certain boundaries in place that, that calls people to accountability so they have to treat people with a degree of e equality or they have to hire with a certain reality to pursuing equality. But even that's not gonna happen because you live in a world of sin. But let's go back to this because ultimately we need to understand that the Greek and Roman philosophy as the goal of the political life is the conceptual root of their theology. So it is not biblical. And the thing I appreciate about Roman Catholics is they don't play a game about it. We're playing a game. 
social justice. It's what Jesus did. That's the same as people who go to church on the first day saying, well, we go to church on the first day of the week because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. And then you go to the Catholic church and they say, you people are going to church on the first day of the week because we changed the day. So that's what I appreciate and respect about Roman Catholicism. So they're telling you the origin of the common good and social justice. What is it? Greek and Roman philosophy. Okay, put that to bed. And it finishes up by saying the task entrusted to civic leaders. All right? Now, let's go on. Notice that this is from the catechism. Okay, now it gets deeper. Because when you get to the catechism, and this is the reason I, I captured these slides, because I wanted you to be able to see just how embedded it is in Roman Catholic theology. This, the catechism is their belief. That's basically their doctrines. Like we have 27 fundamental beliefs or 28 fundamental beliefs. At the end of the day, the catechism are the belief systems of Roman Catholicism. Okay, so that's your, that's your parody, okay? So here we go. Notice what it says. Let's go to the, the sentence where it says, by authority. By authority, one means equality by virtue of each person's or institution's makes law to make law and laws rather and give orders to men and expect obedience from them. Now this is actually becoming more fixed and fast because they talk about expect obedience to them. 1898. This is the number. Each one has a number, okay? It's not the year. Every human community needs an authority to govern it. Okay, now we're getting really serious language. The foundation of such authority lies in human nature. But for human nature, to govern human nature means that you have to have a system by which you are governing. And what you will find is if you study any of this, you will discover that all of this centers around or pivots around what Roman Catholicism calls natural law, okay? Now notice what it says. Here is an, another element of their catechism. The common good presupposes respect for the person as such in the name of the common good. Public authorities, public authorities, your civic authorities, are bound to respect the fundamental and inalienable rights of the human person. Society should permit each of its members to fulfill its, his or her vocation. In particular, the common good resides in the conditions for the exercise of the natural freedoms, watch the term natural freedoms, that's natural law, indispensable for the development of the human vocation, such as the right to act according to sound norm of conscience and to safeguard privacy and rightful freedom also in matters of religion. Now, it sounds like you would have the opportunity to worship according to the dictates of your own conscience, which is in the Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution, but that is not the case. What they're referring to is that if you have a predefined or pre-established uh, order that is being driven by a moral leader, which we now know is the pontiff of Rome, then it's going to be the law or the working laws according to them, of which we know Sunday sacredness is a part which takes us back to Laudato Si. All right? Let's go on a little bit further. The common good requires peace, that is, the stability and security of just order, of a just order. Keep that in mind. It presupposes that authority should ensure by morally acceptable means the security of society and its members. Well, who enforces it? A common good which permits it to be recognized as such, it is in the political community that its most complete realization is found. It is the role of the state, the role of the state, to defend and promote the common good of a civil, civil society, its citizens, and intermediate bodies, all right? Then it goes further from a local common good to a universal common good, right? Now, notice that it goes on and it talks about responsibility and participation. Let's read this. It's necessary that all participate, each according to his position and role, in promoting the common good. So not only will the common good be instituted by the state, but you and I will be held accountable for facilitating or fostering common good. 
Remember, this parity of economies is in that, right? Now that's a lot to absorb in one presentation, but I'm glad that you stuck with me. When we move to our next presentation, the agenda, our final one, part two, we're going to really look at how the re-education is going to take place because when the Vatican, through their pontiff, stated that they wanted all the world to come together, and I want you to take note of who they invited to come together, political leaders, religious leaders, sports figures, academics, and entertainers. Did they leave any part of secular society out? No. When the Bible challenges us to love not the world, neither the things of the world, the Lord is really sharing with us, Christ is challenging us to recognize that we really have no place in this world. So all the things that we hold so dear, consider so valuable, consider so important, are being called to one moral leader who is going to set in motion a re-education for the movement of the world to a new world order crafted around a philosophical basis from Greek and Roman philosophy of the common good and social justice, parity, pursuing parity of economies, and hence, in that context, the introduction of a worship day that belongs to them. We are there. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask, Lord, that you would give us the capacity, the understanding, the desire to absorb so much that we have failed to make ourselves acquainted with when we had the time. So now, Lord, we're running upon all of this information. We're running upon all of these prophetic fulfillments. And for some of those viewing this broadcast, it's overwhelming. And in fact, what they are thinking to themselves is, I'm not ready. I'm not ready for the end. I'm not ready for that which is foretold to come upon the earth. But Lord, you stand ever ready. You stand ever available to help your children wherever they are in their journey of salvation. First of all, Lord, I pray that you would help us to get serious about being Seventh-day Adventist Christians. I pray, Lord, that we would experience a revival in our hearts and in our homes. I pray, Lord, that we would pray for a revival in our respective churches. We don't know when we will be able to worship together again if we are able to worship together again. We also don't know, Lord, if when we come back together again, some of the people that were in the midst of creating conflict and turmoil and confusion in our churches will simply return with that same spirit. Lord, we're asking that you would move on their hearts, that they would use this time, that they are able to just focus on you as a time to really clear up the foolishness of their thinking and the folly of their ways and to bring their lives in harmony with the reality of where we are in the stream of time, the prophetic stream of time. Help us, Lord, to recognize this is not a time to play. This is not a time to be concerned about anything else but being in harmony with Jesus. Bless us, Lord, as we pursue truth, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I look forward to you being with us again tomorrow in our final message, The Agenda, Part 2.